Uh, hello, my name is Elizabeth Tyndale and I am co-head of North American Distribution here at Pizina Investment Management. Thank you for joining our 2021 Outlook webinar where we will be exploring the question as to whether we've begun the great rotation to value. We are thrilled that you have joined us. Two of our portfolio managers will be leading our discussion today. Rich Pizina, our CEO and founder, co-chief investment officer, and co-portfolio manager of our US strategies, along with Allison Fish, a partner and co-portfolio manager of our international emerging markets, international small cap and global best ideas strategies. Thank you so much. And without further ado, here's Rich. Thanks Elizabeth and welcome everyone. Um, this is a really a, a perfect time to ponder the question that um, has been asked of us time and time again is are, are, is this it? Are we start are we starting the long awaited cycle for value investing? Um, it's an exciting time, no doubt. The fourth quarter was was one of the, the the periods of time that we all dream of as value investors when we all get excited that okay, maybe finally, after 10 years of waiting, um, we're ready to start a, a cycle that recognizes valuation. You know, first and foremost, I'm a research analyst. And, and so I tend to look at data to try and understand and draw some conclusions about whether you can even make that call. And while history is not necessarily a, a, a perfect predictor of the future, it is, certainly worth studying. So I, um, I wanted to, we've been talking, I guess I would say we've been talking for the last, oh, I don't know, couple of years about what would you be looking for to see what are the possible catalysts that could say, here we are, this is the cycle. And, and we've identified a few of them. The first and foremost is the start of a recession. If you look backwards over history, the last nine recessions in a row have all coincided with a great value cycle. We're showing the last five on this chart in front of you. And actually, if you go back to as far back as you can find data, the last um, hundred years where there have been 14 recessions, in 12 of them, value outperformed the broad market if you date it back to the beginning of the cycle. What you see here is um, measured on the x-axis are the five prior cycles and then the current cycle in the dark black line where time zero is the day the recession began. In this case, when COVID hit and we measure that back to April, and then you can see how value has done historically over the ensuing years up until the point when the value cycle ended. So what can you conclude from this? Well, generally speaking, post-recession or during beginning in a recession, value starts to outperform and that outperformance extends for um, a reasonably long period of time. Now we have to be realistic in understanding why the outperformance happens. It happens because the performance before the recession was so bad. Um, and the valuations, as we get towards a recession and then the early stages of recession, get compellingly cheap. Um, companies then take action to adjust their operations to the, to the reality of the economic environment that they're facing. This is no different. This happens to be a very severe one, one that we've never experienced as, as an investment team. Um, but nevertheless, the companies respond. And by responding, they restructure, cut costs, they change things to try and cope with the realities of the economic downturn. And then as things start to get better in the downturn, something interesting happens. The value stocks become the momentum stocks. 
In fact, in every single one of these cycles, in the periods initially during and early into recession, value and momentum are the same. We can see that if we flip to the next chart. Here, what we're doing is we're comparing the, the expected earnings per share growth over the next two years um, for deep value, which for us would be the cheapest stocks, the cheapest quintile of stocks in our large cap value universe, US large cap value universe. Um, and then we look at the consensus, these are not ours, but the consensus earnings expectations. So if we look at our cheap stock universe, the consensus believes that EPS will grow 23% a year for the next two years. And the Russell 1000 growth index is expected to grow 17% a year for the next two years. This is what happens when your earnings get killed so much that they, when they recover, the growth rates are high. The interesting part is though, that we can buy this value cohort for 11 times the earnings on average that would exist in the year 2022. And we have to pay two and a half times as much, 27 times earnings for the growth stock composite. This is, this is how value becomes growth. And, and what happens and what has typically happened in these cycles is the growth rate extends beyond the early recovery periods because the companies keep their expenses under control way into the cycle and margins turn out to be higher than everyone expects, which is why the momentum keeps going and why the cycles last as long as they last. Now the starting point, if we can flip to the last chart, um, is the spread in valuation between the cheapest stocks and the most expensive stocks. And here you can see this is a, this is a naive rendering, meaning we're just comparing how cheap are, the, ch are uh, the cheapest stocks based on price to book compared to the most expensive and measure that spread in the number of standard deviations versus the norm. And you can see no matter where you look in the world, the spreads are really, really wide. Um, and, and even with the little blip back, even though it was a great blip, I'll say of the fourth quarter, um, all we've done is come a little off of that in spread terms. So we're, we, we, we are set up, we think for this environment. So I know we're going to go into a Q and a session and I'll just ask myself the first question before I turn it back to Elizabeth, um, and say, well, how do we know this is it? Well. We don't, obviously, but, but these are the things that you should think about. One, what we already saw, which is that the recession has been a good indicator of a switch in regime, regimes. Two, we know that some of these valuations, particularly on the high end, the growth stock component, have been driven by a very, very long period of falling interest rates, which has um, increase the valuation of stocks that have long duration. And it's the falling interest rates, not the low interest rates that have created the tailwind. Once interest rates stop falling, and perhaps we're there, we don't know, then the tailwind for performance of the, of the um, longer duration growth stocks is no longer a factor. Third, is that particularly when you look in the large cap re, uh, uh, sector and companies that have gotten very big in the, in the scheme of markets, these are the Microsofts and the Googles and the Facebooks who have had very strong growth rate as their dominant franchises have gotten valuations to, to what we would think of as extremes. The growth rates in these companies are likely to have some caps and were some um, slackening as these businesses approach maturity and they are approaching maturity. I'll just offer one statistic, the ones driven by digital advertising. So the Googles and the Facebooks, for example, we, we already are over 55% of advertising is digital. So the ability to grow at double digit rates for a very long, long period of time don't exist and the companies have to come up with something new. 
which just raises the risk that the growth rates are, are not sustainable. And finally, and we haven't seen any of sign of this yet, the money that has flowed into companies to fund disruption without a commensurate profit model, we have to wait now and see if we get all the Amazons of the world, or do we get companies that built big businesses that really can't earn what people hope they're gonna earn, in which case that, that flow of funds will fall off. So we think there's four potential catalysts to say that we're, we're, we're getting close, or this is it, we're, uh, we're excited. And now I think I'll turn it over to Elizabeth who will moderate and try and address your questions. Thank you, Reg. I guess the first one, Allison, we've had a couple of questions come in about the markets outside the US. So I've left this slide up for you if you wanna to refer to it. So if you think about value outside the US, which markets provide the best opportunity today? Yeah, thanks for that question, Elizabeth. Um, and thank you for answering it <laughs> with just <laughs> one chart. I mean, the, the reality is today, we are at unprecedented spread levels across the globe. Um, you know, as you can see, whether it's the US, Europe, Japan, or emerging markets, the level of valuation spread is far beyond um, what, what it has been, you know, in recent history. In fact, if, if we were having this conversation a year ago about emerging markets, where I spent a lot of my time, I would have told you we were probably never going to go back to the spread levels we saw in the late 90s, right? I mean, that was the Asia financial crisis, that was the tech bubble. That was a different set of countries, you know, many of them with currencies pegged to the dollar, you know, unstable sovereign regimes, businesses that were not the set that we see today in terms of, of quality. And yet here we are. So truthfully, you can look everywhere today. And in fact, in many of our portfolios, the, the, the tragedy of, of 2020 has really kicked up a lot of opportunity in places where we hadn't seen it in a number of years. And that's across geography as well as across industry. Thank you for that. And Rich, when we think about um, the value rally that we had in the fourth quarter, I guess the question that we got is, how do we know the rally is real? Uh, why is it not another value head fake, so to speak? And what is the greatest risk to a reversal that could occur to the detriment of value stocks? The truth is you don't know until we're done. Um, I wish I could tell you, answer it better than that, but you don't. I, I do wanna though address what we mean by value actually, because I think that's gotten lost, right? We, we, people think of value as a factor. Value is not a factor. Value was never a factor. Factor-based uh, practitioners created portfolios that, that used factors like low price to book and low price to earnings as, a, as an indicator of what value is. But value is not that. that if you define value quite rationally, which is buying something for less than it's worth, then there would be nobody on this call that would say value is dead. If you said value is low price to book, of course we could argue whether low price to book investing is dead. But value is the relationship of a share price to its ability to generate earnings and cash flow over the long term, period. That's what it is. And when valuations get out of whack, they get out of whack because people are fearful. They're in this era, they've been fearful of disruption. They're fearful that they're buying dead industries. You know, I can, I can go example after example. I'll just pick one and then I'm sure we'll get into some more later. But you know, our largest US holding is GE. So GE, um, at the bottom of the cycle in, a, in um, April of last year, sold for $5 a share. Now, if you were sitting here pre-pandemic, looking at GE's largest business, and I'll focus on that for a minute, jet engines. Jet engines, um, the, the, the commercial traffic airline business for the last 60 years 
grew faster than GDP. It grew faster than GDP in the years leading up to the pandemic. Um, GE had a 50% share of every engine that on every flight that was flown in 2019 and a 65% share of every new airplane that was delivered in 2019 made all its money, not on selling the engines, but on keeping them running. So it was a function of using the engines. And if we made a, a very simplifying assumption that air travel never recovers, never recovers from where it is today and make some other negative assumptions. For example, GE never sells another natural gas fired power plant ever again, but the companies adjust their operations as managements do to the reality of the new world. We estimate that GE would earn like something like 75 cents a share once they got their act together. Now, if you, and that would grow, call it like at GDP. So if it did that and you bought for $5 a share, something with 75 cents a share of earnings power that grew at GDP, when you did an IRR calculation, you'd get something like an 18. If I assume that air travel recovers back to the historic norms, and I assume that, how, that people need more natural gas power, which by the way, every energy think tank in the world believes as we go to electrification and replace coal, um, then GE makes substantially more than that. And your IRR calculation comes out at high 20s. It did when GE was five. So if I was sitting there saying, is value dead? I'm not talking about price to book. I'm talking about something that makes absolutely no sense that I could get a high teens IRR in the worst case I could possibly imagine and a high 20s IRR simply returning to the way things were pre-pandemic. And if we assume that that's the range of outcomes, how is it possible not to own that stuff? Especially when you compare it to companies like Microsoft and Google that are, and Facebook that are pushing 30 plus times earnings where you have to believe the growth rates are sustained for decades at the current levels to get even a 8% IRR. That's what we're talking about value, it's arithmetic. Um, and so we have to constantly remind ourselves of that. In the long term, arithmetic works. And that's the only answer to how we feel confident that this is gonna continue. Thank you. Quick follow-up question to that. We've had a couple of people type in um, questions about price to book value and whether or not that's broken as a metric given the amount of intangibles in the economy today. Could you comment on that briefly, please? It may be, I don't really know. Um, I mean, I think value practitioners who use price to book as a metric are being very short-sighted. I think Allison could probably give a great example of, of the commodity businesses that screened up five years ago post the China decline um, as an indication of that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you think about what was happening sort of in the early part of the last decade, you had all of these businesses that had built up their book value during the China boom with the expectation that China would be growing double digits forever, right? And a good deal of that, by the way, was fueled by debt. So here we are sort of in the early part of the last decade and the demand from China is still growing, but not at the levels that people thought. There's no other sort of hidden source of demand that's gonna come out of nowhere um, to, to soak up all of this supply. And now the supply is starting to come online. So the book value is very, very big. The writing's on the wall. So the stock prices have weakened. On price to book, these businesses were screaming cheap. Um, and in fact, you know, our focus on normalized earnings um, begins with a quantitative screening tool that looks back 10 years of history. So these businesses were screening up for us too, because that 10 years of history was a boom period. But that really is where the fundamental analysis and the research comes in. 
Um, I would say in particular, because we organize our team by sector globally, we were able to look at some of these businesses um, that had really boomed during that boom period and say, you know, this is not a 17% return on capital business. You know, this is an 8% um, in a normalized environment and adjust our expectations for the businesses accordingly. But if all you did was look at price to book, you would have bought these all day long. I would say conversely, you know, some of the businesses I think that people get excited about today, you know, that, that the questioner is referring to these businesses that have a lot of intangible, that have no real tangible book value, those businesses will always look cheap on price to book. I mean, sorry, always look expensive, <laughs> got that backwards, but they will always look expensive. And so if you're simply investing on the basis of the price to book valuation metric, you are basically excluding your portfolio from a decent portion of the market. And another question for you, Allison, and when people think of lower valuation companies, the concept of junk, so to speak, often comes to mind. And during the GFC, coming out of the GFC rather, we saw a very strong quote unquote junk rally. So how do we make sure that we're buying high quality businesses and not junk? And how is this time different in this particular cycle? Yeah, yeah, great question. So the reality is when you have a near death experience and you survive, the junk will always rally more than the businesses where you had downside protection. So let's just you know put that on the table. But over the long term, we're looking to own sustainable businesses. And so we really obsess about downside protection. I mean, truthfully, if you think about where we're hunting when we look for new investments for the portfolio, we're only looking at the cheapest portion of the investment universe, right? So, so if we get it right, we've got a double or a triple on our hands. The way that you really create alpha though is by protecting yourself from when you get it wrong. And that's where obsessing about the downside comes in. And that can take lots of different forms. It may mean a balance sheet you know, with flexibility in lending lines or even a net cash position. It may mean this is a business that has a lot of operational flexibility that you come to understand as you get to know it. It may mean this business has ancillary assets that aren't core to the value of the business that could be sold off if things get worse. Um, but it's really essential to have that downside protection because when you get it wrong, if you don't lose that much, and then when you get it right, you gain a lot, you create that really attractive risk reward skew. Um, but again, I do have to say when there's a near death experience and you don't die, you will have been better off owning that levered junk, but that's not the way that we're looking to invest. Rich, we've had a few questions in terms of interest rates and how it relates to the current value cycle. Uh, do we need interest rates to fall for this value cycle to continue? Can the value cycle exist at current levels? Could you just comment on the relationship between interest rates and the value cycle, please? Yeah, I tried to refer to it earlier, but I just want to make the point very clear. Yes, interest rates falling are really not great for a value um, strategy. And interest rates falling are great for a growth strategy. Just simple arithmetic. Um, once they stop falling, all you get is the cash flow yield and the growth. You don't get a valuation increase. So if I pay 35 times earnings for something, I earn 3% a year, plus whatever growth that company can eke out for as long as it can eke it out. No multiple expansion. Um, and when I own, own a value stock that has a current yield or a, call it a normal yield, meaning many of these companies have depressed earnings, so you have to allow for the earnings to recover into a normal environment. A normal yield of 12 or 13, and they grow maybe some slower than the, the other companies. Um, it's, there is no headwind from, from valuation. So forget value. People like to think of what's gonna make the multiple go up of your stocks. I would tell you, we could care less if the multiple, I mean, we would like it, but we're not buying these companies for the multiple to go up. We're buying it because we wanna collect the cash flow that's gonna give us double digit expected returns. And if the multiple goes up, once people realize their double digit returns in a world that offers four, then the multiple will go up and that will be the, the kicker. So no, we would be very happy with stable interest rates. Falling interest rates are not gonna be good for a value strategy. 
So should we see the likelihood of going to the negative interest rate environment, which I have to admit is a possibility. I happen to believe it's a low odds possibility, um, especially with what's going on in government policies. Um, I, um, I, I, I think we're on the right side of the bet. The odds that interest rates stay stable or go up, I think are way, way, way higher than the odds that they go down. And I think we wind up winning in the stay stable or the go up. Thank you. And Allison, we've had a couple of questions about the non-US markets and Europe particularly. Uh, could you speak to the overall thesis for investing in Europe? And is Europe structurally inferior, inferior to the US with respect to its ability to grow earnings? And could you also comment on the thesis around the European banks as well, please? Sure, that's a lot. Um, <laughs> first and foremost, valuation has to be our guide here, right? And so when you look around the world, the valuations in Europe are particularly compelling, I would say, in particular, um, at, in, in comparison to the United States. So that's sort of the, the, the first and foremost, it gets your attention. The questioner brings up this issue of, you know, is Europe structurally disadvantaged versus the US um, in some industries? I would say in some industries, somewhat yes. I mean, within the US, you have one big geography. It's basically one market. Broadly, you know, the same language is spoken everywhere. Um, regulatory regimes may vary by state, but certainly not to the extent that you see across geographies in Europe. So in that respect, it, it can be a more challenging market. And you see that expressed in certain industries where the returns that the companies earn are lower than what you see in the US. Telecoms, for example, you know, each country within Europe is its own competitive market. Um, that's much more difficult than the scale you see across the US. Now that said, there are a number of European champions um, which you see discounts to their valuation simply because of that European domicile even though it's completely irrelevant to their business. I'm talking about true global franchises um, where the valuation should really be um, reflective of the geographies in which they operate. Um, and you don't always see that, you know, sort of apple to apple, a, a European domiciled versus a US domiciled business. And then you ask about the European banks. So all of the things that I mentioned about, you know, Europe being structurally disadvantaged versus the US can apply certainly to, to banks where you have country specific regulators in addition to, to across, the, across the continent. Um, and you also have demography sort of working against you. Now that said, again, I have to stress not only valuation, but where these banks are in their earnings cycle. You know, if you sort of think back to the GFC, the US was much quicker to restructure its financial services, right? So those financials are much further now along that path to recovery than we see in Europe. We do see a lot of recovery still to come um, in the European banks that we own. I would say each of them is there for a company specific reasons and we see individual company specific levers within each of them, but broadly as a group, you know, they are still on that path to recovery and, and we see movement along that path, even, even during this COVID period. Thank you. And then we had a question on emerging markets, um, just because you highlighted that out of the gate that obviously um, the spreads are very interesting and, and near Asian crisis peaks from the 90s. Um, in the last 12 months, as the pandemic hit, certainly it probably kicked up new opportunities. Can you think of or speak to stocks and geographies where we've been able to buy things that are new and quite different than they've been in the portfolio over the previous years? Yeah, great, great question. So I would say, you know, broadly, what happened during COVID was the cheap got cheaper. So it is not as if we saw a full scale rotation in what was screening up for us in that, that first quintile of cheap companies, which is our hunting ground. But that said, there were some very attractive babies that got thrown out with the bathwater during COVID. You know, very early on, um, we very quickly invested in two names, one of which we had done a lot of work on fairly recently, um, but wound up not being cheap enough. That's Galaxy Entertainment, which is a Macau casino company. You know, luckily we had recently visited their properties along with those of their peers. And so we had a view, you know, that these were good properties, both the legacy um, casino, as well as their newer, uh, property on the Kotai Peninsula. But when COVID hit, everything ground to a halt. You know, 
when nobody is showing up at all, there are some pretty serious implications for your business. That said, this is a, a casino company with a net cash balance sheet. So even when we stress tested the business with expectations of things being completely shut down and or recovering much more slowly than our base case, we could easily see that our equity stake would be intact even in those, those bearish scenarios. So we were happy to add that to the portfolio. Another one that we added sort of in the, the spring, early summer is trip.com in China. This is formerly known as C-Trip. Some people might be more familiar with that name, um, giant online travel portal in China. So obviously there's a great sort of secular growth underpinning um, to the company in terms of demand, but when COVID hits, nobody's going anywhere. Um, and this company actually did the right thing. I have to say, you know, sort of early on, if you had a trip scheduled with C-Trip, they refunded you right away. And then they got the money back from the airline and the hotel. If any of you had travel planned for March and April, you'll know in the US, that's not exactly the way things went down. Um, but that said, that did have implications for the business in terms of its reported financials in that quarter, right? Because they were paying the cash out the door before they got it all in. Um, that said, not only did that make customers happy, it appears to have helped them gain a bit of market share along the way, um, which we're now seeing as we're seeing some of that, that travel recover in China. So those were two were sort of early on in the crisis. You know, a geography that got a bit more interesting for us was Brazil. So the last few years sort of post the Bolsonaro um, election in Brazil, we have really struggled to find cheap companies. You know, most of what has been cheap, has a structural issue behind it um, because there had been so much optimism around the, the recovery of the economy when that happened. Unfortunately, Brazil has been very hard hit by COVID. And so in that event, a number of really great businesses screened up in the first quintile because of that, that sort of extreme pain that we saw in Brazil. And I, you know, I'll just pause here to mention, you know, emerging markets it's always an exciting and diverse place, but I will say sort of the effect that COVID had on various geographies and the differences that you see between them um, has, has been pretty stunning as well. But at any rate, within Brazil, this allowed us to add two um, really high quality franchises to the portfolio. Itaú, which is arguably the best um, bank in Brazil, and we've seen them deal very recently with a very deep recession that Brazil had, you know, sort of in the mid-teens um, of, of the last decade. And then also Ambev, um, the beer uh, manufacturer, you know, huge market share within Brazil, but COVID hits, people are not going out. You have a mix issue because a lot of the premium beer gets drunk in restaurants, which are now closed. You also have currency problems as most of the raw materials get priced in dollars. Um, but the final product of course is priced in Brazilian reai and you can't raise prices when you have the economy in this much pain. So lots and lots and lots of pain um, but a really high quality franchise that we were happy to grab. And I will say also, you know, over the last several years, you'll, you'll notice if you look at our portfolio that we've been pretty underweight consumer staples and that's really a result of valuation. So here we were able to buy a true consumer staples business um, at our own sort of cheapskate pricing. Thank you. And Rich, just to switch back to the overall valuation of the market, we've had a couple of questions as to okay, value is priced to outperform growth, but is value priced to deliver attractive total return over the next decade, or is everything in equities just too expensive? Well, one of the most interesting phenomenon of this, I'm gonna call it the last 50 years. So it's all, you can't say it's an interesting phenomenon. It's a clearly established fact. And I don't have this chart to show you, so I'm just gonna describe it. But if I, if I looked at, the cheapest stocks, and for that, we're going to say the one fifth of the cheap, most cheaply priced stocks measured now on PE. So you'll have to forgive me for using factors, but I use them to illustrate, not to, to um, make investment decisions. I could buy the, the, a cheap stock 50 years ago for 10 times earnings. And I can buy a cheap stock today for 10 times earnings. There's been absolutely no change in valuation. And if you look at the, if you just look at a graph of the cheapest one fifth of all stocks, it's been 10 times earnings for 50 years. Now it zigs and zags. So I'm exaggerating slightly, but the truth is there's no trend in valuation. That means that if I, 
I should be able to get a low teens IRR no matter when I buy a value portfolio, as long as I hold it for a reasonable period of time. And I think if you look at history, it will, you will judge that to be the case, including the 10 years ended pre-COVID. And I'm hedging a little bit because this was a bad year and I'll, I'll be able to say it again in a few years, but including the 10 years pre-COVID. So if I built a US large cap value portfolio 10 years ago in this mass nasty anti-value environment, you would have made, we made like 11 and a half percent a year for the 10 years. Um, it was very normal. It was not an anti-value period. The crazy part of the market was everything else. That's, and, and value got trashed, not because it did poorly, but because it did poorly compared to the broad market, which was dominated by some big franchises that drove it to a substantially higher 10 year return. I can still get double digit expected returns. I can build a portfolio and fill it with companies where I can have an expected return of double digit. The most expensive stocks 50 years ago sold for 20 times earnings. Today, the most expensive stocks sell for 50 times earnings. And that um, expansion in value started exactly when interest rates peaked in 1980 and continued for 40 years. Why investors didn't apply lower discount rates and raise the valuation of the cheap stocks, I can't answer that question. They just didn't. So question actually for the both of you, but maybe we'll start with Allison for the non-US perspective. Um, people have asked about the difference between value in large cap versus small cap, and particularly outside the US. You know, ex-US, um, we don't see a huge difference in terms of, you know, overall valuations. You know, we see the sort of the, the set of businesses also looking pretty similar. And you can see that if you if you sort of compare our international portfolio with our international small cap portfolio, um, I would say on the small cap side, we, we do have a more significant weighting to industrials, but I think that's a little bit of a misnomer. You know, in small cap land, you, you have a lot of sort of unique niche businesses, um, many of which get thrown into there. Um, but sort of across the board, I would say the cheap opportunities remain in the most highly cyclical areas. So, you know, financials, consumer discretionary, industrials, all kicking up sort of interesting things. But in terms of overall valuations, um, there's not a huge disparity in that portion of the globe. In rich in the U.S.? You know, you, you, the, the question is different if you compare the value of small cap to the value of large cap in the U.S. There's clearly a big valuation gap there that ought to close. If you compare the valuation of small cap value and large cap value, the cheapest stocks, in both um, uh, universes, there's much less different, differentiation. So if you're gonna build a value portfolio, there's good opportunities in both. If you were gonna just build a broad market portfolio, there's a big valuation gap to the advantage of small versus large in the United States. And then we've gotten a couple of questions on the energy sector, just our views generally speaking, but also really specifically with the advent of focus on carbon emission and then moving towards a more greener world, does it make energy still a good investment and why is it a value investment? Well, look, energy, one of the interesting things about energy is um, the demand for energy is, is embedded in our society's way of functioning. So, we're now talking about substituting carbon emitting forms of energy, uh, having them substituted by clean energy. And we have a big, big push towards electrification. We have um, um, government actions towards um, penalizing the, the emission of carbon. We have the very recent Biden policy of discouraging investment. Um, None of these things change whether you get in your car every day and drive it. Now, maybe when it's time to change 
your car, you'll consider making an electric car, you're buying an electric vehicle, um, but it's a slow process. And um, BP does an, a very interesting annual outlook for energy. And they did the major anti-carbon case. And it's interesting if you can get a copy of it to read it, they talked about um, what has what has to happen to the world if you assume maximum possible government subsidies towards electrification of the car fleet and maximum punitive penalties um anti-carbon penalties in that case bp believes that there's still 20 trillion dollars that needs to be invested in the energy business worldwide um, the energy players understand that they're in a transition business. They are not gonna be left with stranded assets. The life of an oil and gas well is way, way, way shorter than any foreseeable need for oil and gas. Gas in particular, because gas is gonna be in high demand as we transition to more electrification. Um, and so, um, when you got the value, let me just take it one step further. When you start doing things like Biden energy policy, which are basically restricting supply, I'm fairly certain that everybody's gonna read that in the newspaper and then drop, get back in their suburban and drive to the mall. That's what's gonna happen. And so if you restrict supply and with and you stigmatize investors who invest in the energy sector so that no capital can flow into it from outside the only way that the 20 trillion dollars is going to be invested and it has to be otherwise the world will cease to function um, is if oil prices are high enough to create the incentive to find oil and so we have fairly sizable exposure, mostly in the drilling companies, which we think are gonna be the beneficiary of that $20 trillion. They are the beneficiary of that $20 trillion. Um, it's gonna be driven by rising cash flows in the oil sector from higher prices, which has to happen. We have to drill more wells, otherwise we're running out of oil before the demand goes away. We have to. So this is one of those easier ones, I think. Um, and then when you talk to the companies, especially when you engage in them on an ESG basis with them, they get it, right? They, their focus is satisfying the transitionary demand for energy while minimizing the negative impact on society. And all of them will talk to you about that. And if you actually engage with them on a sophisticated level, you, you would be very surprised to hear how much good a sector, if you could call it that, um, relative to what could be done if they weren't focused on these issues. And it's generating low, somewhat competitive advantage for the people that are doing it. So I'll, I would say, Energy is a particularly interesting area. Um, you can buy in now in the major oil companies, oil and gas reserves, where you don't even have to believe that they drill any more wells. If you just buy what they already have, and if it got priced today where oil is and it stayed at today's prices, you would have double digit free cash flow returns through liquidation, including getting your money back. Um, and if prices go higher, which we think they will, you're going to get even better returns. In the interest of time, I think we'll ask one more question. And Allison, it's about China, and it's very topical to what's going on um, in the last couple of weeks. So with China being such a dominant part of emerging markets, yet representing a communist uh, regime, how do, we, uh, how do we factor in issues regarding property rights, rule of law, et cetera? And the, um, the questioner is specifically thinking about everything that's gone on with Jack Ma in recent weeks. 
And how do we, and the, the, the last part of the question is, do we prefer to get Chinese expo exposure through non-Chinese companies or we do it directly through China? Uh, thanks for the question. So it is true that within China, and I will say a, a lot of other places as well, you are often investing in companies where there is a majority shareholder or controlling entity um, that may or may not share your best interests. And you know, often in the case of China, you're talking about state-owned enterprises. Now, what's gone on with, with Jack Ma, you know, that's actually not a state-owned enterprise. And, and I think, you know, it's a really interesting snapshot of where valuations get placed. You know, when you know you're buying a company that's controlled by the state, today there's a very, very big discount on that business. Right? But these recent events would tell you that even when you're not, the government may come in and do things, right? So, so should you really be paying up for these privately owned businesses that a lot of our um, competitors would say, you know, you, you, you should only own privately owned companies in emerging markets. But then again, you know, if they're under the, the control of the state as well, maybe you shouldn't, you know, maybe that trade doesn't, doesn't make as much sense as people thought it did. Um, sort of beyond that, I would say for us, the most that we can know is to know what we don't know, which is to say there is a wider range of outcomes in a business where you may have a government or a controlling shareholder step in and do something. Um, and so I would say, you know, when you look sort of at our emerging markets portfolio relative to our other regional portfolios, it by design um, is a bit more diversified. And that sort of is, is meant to take into account the idea that you can have a wider range of outcomes um, in a lot of these countries and in a lot of these businesses. Beyond that, we also expect more out of them. And when I say that, I mean, we're applying more punitive discount rates to the streams of earnings coming out of those businesses. For, for people who are unfamiliar with our methodology, um, we utilize this concept of normalized earnings, um, but you can think of that as the outcome of a DCF. So for emerging markets businesses, we apply country specific discount rates that are meant to encapsulate some of this additional risk. Great, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us today. I wanna to take a moment and thank Rich and Allison for joining me today, and especially thank our many colleagues who work behind the scenes to produce this webinar in true Pazina fashion, it's taken a village. And finally, I wanna just highlight, uh, we often produce proprietary investment content, including our newsletter commentaries, white papers, and podcasts. And all of these are available on our website, so feel free to visit pazina.com. Thank you again for joining us and have a nice day.